we've lost huge amounts of mental health funding specifically targeted at eliminating social emotional learning in schools and it is coming at an enormous cost we have um in our in our state here um suicide is the leading cause of death for children mm. and so this should be the headline news welcome to the kindness is podcast where we take a deep dive into the true meaning of kindness i'm your host caitlin johnstone the co-founder of kind cotton let's dive in Hey y'all, we have an amazing episode lined up for you this week. The person who I have on has an incredible story about perseverance and strength, and she is doing so much good, particularly in the field of mental health and mental well-being in schools. You know, something that I think about often that I actually shared with Sunny is that Republicans, any single time, there is another mass murder or there is a death due to guns, particularly when it has to do with children. They bring up this trope of mental health. And I am not saying that that does not play a part in it. However, we have seen in other countries that have just as many mental health concerns and mental health issues, there aren't the gun deaths. And then my argument back is always, Why are you defunding mental health services in schools? Why are you stripping funding away if you are claiming that mental health is the cause to all of this harm for children? The funding for Sunny's program was stripped away in Arizona. Luckily, there were some incredible donors who came to the rescue and have kept this program going strong. So I can't wait to share her story about mindfulness and its overall impact on our mental well-being. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Kindness Is podcast. I am beyond excited to have Sunny White here with me today. She's the co-founder and executive director of Mindfulness First, a Scottsdale-based nonprofit that provides mental health education in schools, businesses, and communities. Mindfulness First is a pioneer in making mental health, life skills, and wellness accessible to everyone, regardless of ability, background, or financial means. In 10 years, they have impacted over 350,000 people. Sunny, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. I want to hear a little bit about your personal journey. What inspired you to start Mindfulness First? Well, you know, it all started um, in 2009. Um, uh, I was uh, st- I was having these really weird experiences. I was like, I had two kids. I had a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and um, we had just moved. And um, I was finding myself like falling asleep in like really weird places. <laughs> was really strange and then one day um i looked in the mirror it was october 2009 and i had lesions that were appearing around my head and you know how your gut kind of knows something's wrong um i knew in that moment i something wasn't good and um long story short um i was in the midst of a major depressive episode a nervous breakdown um my body had sort of succumbed to perpetual fight flight freeze and stress and which meant that shingles had been able to activate in my body from from uh, the chickenpox virus that had existed since i was a kid so i had shingles I had major depression, I had fatigue um, that was quite debilitating and um, I honestly, I thought I was going to die. It was, uh, it was mm-hmm. really frightening. Um, but what I wanted was to live for my children, even, even though it sounds dramatic that I felt like I was going to die. Um, I think if I hadn't taken care of myself or looked after my body, it would have continued to degrade. It, that definitely mm-hmm. would have happened, but I didn't. What happened was um, one doctor that I saw said to me, you know, I think you're super stressed out. I think you're really, and I didn't know what that meant. And so mm-hmm. I, I Googled it. I Googled 
super stressed out and I found a book called Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn, which is a mindfulness book um, that's used in, uh, it's a program that's used in hospitals, used with soldiers. And that sort of began my journey to sort of understanding what stress is, how it affects the body and the mind, um, and how I can actually have some semblance of um, uh, control, uh, 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 regulation over those big feelings. And as I learned this, um, and I did other things too, I, I started playing the piano, I started painting, I started, I started taking care of me. Mm. And, um, and as I started to do these things, I was like, like, wait a minute, this is so simple. I should have known this when I was little. I should have known that about the prefrontal cortex and how I can access my prefrontal cortex by using these particular techniques, et cetera. So that's where it all began. Um, and we opened Mindfulness First in 2013, myself and one of my uh, closest friends um, who also cares deeply about mindfulness. That's amazing. Yeah. Kudos to you. you. And I think Thank that's you. something that we don't, we don't talk about enough, particularly here in our country. Like mm -hmm. we don't talk about putting ourselves first. It's very put out, put out, put out, create, consume this hamster wheel of running, going. I mean, the reason why mental health is so important to me, and we talked about this a little bit before we hopped on the call, is my dad was very much a product of that. I mean, he grew up not having access to any money, really, family that struggled. And he had it in his mind that he was going to provide for me. I wasn't going to have the same life that he had had, which led him to working three jobs, being somehow, I don't even know how it's humanly possible, a present father, a caregiver for his father who was aging. And it ultimately led to a severe mental breakdown in which he was diagnosed bipolar when he was in his 50s, which if anyone listening to this knows anything about the mental health field, that's pretty much unheard of. And it was because of his lack of sleep, his constant stress, his constant working and kind of just being overloaded and never ever taking a moment for himself. So I can I can deeply appreciate what you share with me. And having been a daughter who had to experience that as a family member, it's why I try to get ahead of my mental well-being, why I don't live the same way that my parents lived, because I want to ensure that I'm the best version of me, not only for myself, but for my family. Mm, thank you for sharing that. And um, I want to just relate to you so that you don't feel alone. Um, I come from a family that has extensive hereditary bipolar that we didn't realize either mm. until um, I, I have um, a family member who has had juvenile bipolar, which is very, very rare. Mm -hmm. And um, but I have it going way back through the through the ages and it does get missed and I also have been diagnosed with a very late in life and it's because what happens for people like me and your dad our kind of bipolar it it makes us it makes us do we do 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 right we yeah. we, get, we get on and we do it and we do it and we do it but it takes such a toll on our bodies and minds we just look like hard workers yeah, really, but really, we're on the inside. It's, it's, uh, it's something else. So I, um, I really relate to that, and and I'm sorry to hear that for your dad too. And um, I know it's hard being a family with bipolar, so I understand. Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to connect with people who understand, particularly not talking about it for many years, which is why I think what you are doing is so, so important because I've been noticing some trends that we're, we're kind of going back to not talking about it, particularly in schools. And this is another thing that Sunny and I talked about prior to hopping on this call, but having been a kindergarten teacher, I can't even tell you that 
the impact, or I can't even tell you how great the impact is of talking about mindfulness, of sharing books surrounding mental health and mental well-being and social emotional learning. I mean, that's pretty much all being a kindergarten teacher is. You know, you're you're teaching yep. these these tiny little humans about the importance of emotions and mm-hmm. regulating emotions and how to be a kind friend and kind to ourselves. And I know that's something that has really been under attack at the moment. Oh yeah, for sure. And it and 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 at the worst time possible, right? So we're coming out of a pandemic where children were isolated, frightened, grieving, uh, had food insecurity, home insecurity. So we had lots of stuff happening that changed the brain, but they didn't also have that social emotional time because they couldn't go to school. So they couldn't learn to to relate. So um, it's really strange that we're in this weird moment in time where social emotional teaching is being attacked. Um, and, and it's just simply being misunderstood. And I, I'm not sure how we got here, um, but I, um, if, if, if I had the opportunity to speak to people who, who did misunderstand it, um, I, w- I would share with them that, that it's, it's the most important thing. It's the missing piece in education. It's the foundation of education. If we don't have those social emotional skills, which like you say, we have to start when they're the littlest. We're starting when the littlest. But um, I know me when I had my nervous breakdown, um, I was learning social emotional skills at that point too, to, mm-hmm. to help me get better. Um, but here in Arizona, we, we've been struggling a lot and we're not the only ones. We've lost huge amounts of mental health funding specifically targeted at eliminating social emotional learning in schools. And it is coming at an enormous cost. We have um, in, our, in our state here, um, suicide is the leading cause of death for children. Mm. And so w- this should be the headline news. Yeah, it should be. So, social emotional should be the number one. I mean, I have a principal who said, we just need to go back to learning how to be together. You know, we've come back from the pandemic and we don't know how to talk to each other. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, we, we're experiencing it here in Arizona. There's definitely um, uh, problems across the nation with people misunderstanding what what social emotional learning is can you take a moment to describe that can well social emotional it is? yeah yeah i mean it's so, well when when we're teaching we have sort of like this trifecta of what we teach and we start um in the heart of it is mindfulness because we can't teach social emotional learning without having mindfulness so i always talk about trauma mindfulness, social, emotional learning. And so when when we want to learn about how to be in the body, how to notice what's happening inside and outside of our body so that we can regulate it and so that we can be present and, and do all the fun things and, and understand the hard things, if we want to do that, we firstly have to have a little bit of trauma understanding because when we go in the body, we're going to bump into hard stuff like stuff that happened in the pandemic, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's going to happen, though, is if we do go into the body and learn about what's happening in the body in a trauma-informed way, the end result will be incredible social emotional skills. It happens naturally. So we'll be making good decisions. We will be making, we'll be good friends. We'll know how to speak to people in a, in a nice way and we'll be able to understand what are they saying? What are they feeling? We won't want to contribute to any of their pain because we're understanding how they are as a person. We're socially and emotionally relating. And there's so there's so many ways that those skills help us to become um, a healthy and productive society. Empathy, I believe, is at the root of changing a lot of things. And I think what you were just Mm -hmm. talking about is really cultivating a space in which empathy can thrive. I was so fortunate when I was younger. I mean, I never even knew the term mindfulness, but I was a part of a very unconventional dance company growing up. 
And my dance teacher would always talk about being present and being in the moment. And we would not only move our bodies in unity, but she would hold these, what she called were philosophy lessons, like mini philosophy lessons for us. And I can remember this one technique that we used to do fairly frequently where we would all line up facing one another and she would tell us when to switch to a new partner and we would stand there in silence, just looking at the face of the other person in front of us. And it sounds so awkward to say if you have never practiced this before, but just being present and deeply seeing another human being was so so powerful mm -hmm. and i don't i don't know why what you had just mentioned brought that up but i think that's something that we we need to get back to right mm -hmm. we need to be able to communicate with one another and children especially now mm -hmm. more than ever need time and space to be with one another and to learn about one another so that we can continue to create a society that is more understanding and more, more empathetic. And I just find that that is something that is a little bit lacking right now. Mm -hmm. I agree with you completely. What a beautiful practice. I, yeah. I, almost, I almost feel like I want to put that in our curriculum. And it was I, amazing. And that's beautiful. And um, I it helped. I, I wanted to share with you our curriculum so that you would um, uh, know that we we do have that in there. And I think it's so interesting, as in kindness and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do the really hard stuff for it's a sixteen week curriculum that we work with kids and adults. We'll do really hard stuff for the first like fourteen weeks. We'll be doing thoughts, emotions, the big, heavy, heavy stuff. And then we end it with what really matters, which is what you're talking about. The empathy, the kindness, the generosity. Those are the final lessons because we take what we learned and we learn to be that um, that uh, friend, that, that, mm -hmm. that uh, fellow citizen, that, that good mom, that good sibling, you know. Um, so uh, I, I really relate to what you're saying, and I think empathy is very missing. Yeah. Now, how do people go about having your program come to their schools or go to their place of work? Is it solely based in Arizona? Do you work with schools and businesses across the country? Tell us a little bit more about the process. Yeah, we can. We work with people across the country, um, and we we work as both schools and businesses. We we can train people virtually. That's that's the good thing, and we can train um, uh, students virtually as well as teachers virtually. And we can give uh, lifelong training so that teachers can do this for the rest of their career. Our goal is to just. To get them trained and and give them the resources and let them um, and let them run with it. Um, and so we we also um, we will we do also work with businesses as well. And it's a similar looking thing. Um, something that matters to us though, that I really want to emphasize is human connection. It's uh, the the. the we know that that's the healing part. Um, so we, while we do offer stuff online, we like to be with people as much as we humanly can. So we're always working on the better ways that we can do that. But, but um, we can train people almost anywhere um, uh, and train them to be teachers, to be practitioners, to be um, great students. We can, we, can, we can train them in many ways. I love that. Can you share with us a little bit about what it would look like when you go into a school, particularly? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll give you an example of, um, you know, how how do we create a mindful school? Um, so we've done it. We've done this a few times. So and we actually have a mindful district at this moment, too. So let's take the school. We'll come into the school and it's it, you, it's about a three year process. And that might sound to teachers, it might sound a little like, oh my God, yes. another, another thing I have to do. Um, but it takes three years because um, you can't take a lifetime of behaviors 
um, and uh, or or habits and just turn them around, right? And I can tell you that after my breakdown, right, it took a long time to, mm -hmm. to to learn to to be healthier, to be well. And so we come in and we we train all the teachers um, for 16 weeks and we train all the kids for 16 weeks. So the teachers and the kids are learning the same thing at the same time. It just takes about 30 minutes a week. It doesn't take very much commitment wow. at all. Yeah. And then what we'll do is that'll be probably the fall semester of the first year. And then we come in into in the second semester of the first year and we'll do professional developments and start supporting the teachers as they begin to bring it into the classroom. And then the second year we'll come in and we'll train any new teachers and we'll do uh, and we'll maybe reinforce in the classrooms that didn't feel they quite got it the year before. We'll reinforce it and work with them and then we'll start to work on the sustainability plan, which will mean having leaders who are running this programming and making it highly sustainable so that we can step away um, and leave a mindful school um, in place. I love that. And within oh, the program, I'm curious, are there are there books included? Is there meditation practices included? Is there yoga infused? What are some of the main tools that you use to implement a mindful school? Um, so we use, all, we use all kinds of things. Um, we use a lot of mindful moments. So mindful moments will start everything and tra transition everything. So teachers learn to use that to settle the nervous system, whatever the kids are doing. But we provide them with an online login to all of our curriculums and multiple resources just press and play um, and full uh, mindful movement practice cards so that and that's their favorite thing the kids mm -hmm. love to do the mindful movement the most. <laughs> so we can help them sort of crack that stress out of their body every lesson we teach has mindful movement every lesson we teach has um mindful uh moment um our goal really though is for it to not be about the curriculum in the end mm -hmm. is for it and, and we've seen this happen is for it to sort of become the culture right the 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 People are plucking stuff from the curriculum and using it when there's a conflict in the classroom or using it um, just to help settle everybody um, when they've come in from the playground, right? That kind of stuff. So, um, and, and also we see it a lot being used um, in difficult moments. So, uh, in a, so we can change a moment from a punitive disciplinary moment to a, to a restorative moment. That is such an important piece because, yes. I mean, I feel as though there's been a lot of studies now, and you would know way better than me because this is your wheelhouse, about the impacts on restorative justice mm -hmm. as opposed to punitive punishments. And there have been mm -hmm. some schools that have really, really taken this on. And the outcome is amazing because yeah. we know the stats, right? We know that particularly black and brown students at disproportionate levels are being suspended mm -hmm. or are wrongfully accused of aggressive behaviors that may just be otherwise be labeled as being a child if if your skin looked like mine or yours, right? So I think that is just so special. And I'm happy to hear that your program offers the opportunity to do just that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and we've seen incredible, incredible success. I mean, office referrals just absolutely plummeting. Um, and that's your empathy piece and the compassion mm -hmm. piece that happens between the children too. Um, but also because the children are, are, are allowed to make mistakes. They're just mm -hmm. allowed. Yeah, and they're not sent home. They're not sent, mm -hmm. they're not suspended. They're, we've seen suspension rates like they just dropped from uh, one of our schools recently was 92 percent it dropped in suspension rates because why send them home right let's help them learn um to to regulate and, and feel better and and know how to to work in the classroom yeah and i think that's a huge piece that is missing too is mm -hmm. children oftentimes aren't allowed the same mistakes that adults are or aren't seen yeah in their full humanity yeah which 
this gives them the opportunity to do just that. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> of course. Anyone who may be listening to this who feels super activated at the moment, right? Like I often talk about cultivating kindness in a world of chaos, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's something that I always need to center myself in. What advice would you give them? Um, well, the wonderful thing is it, your breath is with you all the time, right? So your, your, your breath is here all the time. And once you know the connection between how you breathe and how it regulates um, your nervous system, your brain and all that, uh, biological information, you know that you can lean in to to deep breathing, which sounds so simple. It sounds so incredibly simple, but taking that pause in that moment can change absolutely everything, including your health and your well-being. Because if you perpetuate that that activation and that feeling of difficulty, it's it's only going to get harder for you, and it's going to get harder to turn it around. So. Um, my advice would always be to step away or even in the moment, like I could do a mindful breath right now and you wouldn't know, right? I would be doing my deep breathing. You can be in a situation that's hard and just focus on how your breathing feels, where you feel it the most and make it deeper and longer so that you can send that message to your brain that everything's okay mm. and you can do this. I just did that. As oh, you were did speaking, I was like, I need to slow down my breath. And I was looking at the video saying, can she tell that I'm doing this right now? And then you said, I could do it right now and no one would know. So <laughs> I appreciate that. We're currently in a stage in our family. We have a daughter who's four and we really try to focus on breath. Like even when she's not activated so that she knows that it feels good for her body when she's happy too. And when I tell you, it has been the biggest struggle because when she is upset, she's like, breathing doesn't make me happy. <laughs> and the breathing doesn't, I don't want to take a deep breath, but I know that we just need to continue. And it's a, it's a growth process, right? Yeah. Um, I get I it. it there. Yeah, we've heard that before. And we, you know, and we'll hear it from all the students. Oh my gosh, this is so boring. Like, mm. <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing? Um, but the, the repetition and mm. the, 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 they start to feel it. They start to feel it. But your daughter, she may enjoy other ways of regulating too. Um, there, there's so many different ways, right, you, you, um, that we can think of. So, um, but I hear her. I've heard it before. <laughs> yeah, for sure. She will actually, I mean, it's pretty amazing. She's to the point where she will tell me like, that doesn't make me happy. Reading a book or tickling makes me happy or like just the Aww. most random thing. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> well, that's okay. We could do these things too. It's like my immediate go-to is breath work because I think that's mm -hmm. what's ingrained in me. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously having an array of different tools is so important. Sunny, before we go, since this is the Kindnesses podcast, I would love to hear what your definition of kindness is. Oh, my definition of kindness I feel like it's just um, being present with another human fully in that moment. Um, it's what, that's, that's everything you can give to somebody, right? That's everything you can give to them. The, it doesn't have to be a monetary item. Um, and I've experienced, I've had the gift of experiencing that so many times, both given to me and um, I've learned to give it to others too. So for me, it's being present with another person. That's amazing. Tell mm -hmm. everyone before we go to where they can follow you or how they can support the work that you are doing. Oh, thank you. Yes, we welcome your support. Um, visit our website at mindfulnessfirst.org. You'll find us on Facebook, Mindfulness First, Instagram, Mindfulness First. Um, and we'd love to have your support. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Kindness Is Podcast. If you love it and it's adding even a little bit of value to your life, 
we would love, love, love if you could subscribe, rate, and review so we can reach even more people and make this world a little bit more kind.